you so much, LCA, for this opportunity to share with you a topic that is very, very close to my heart. And looking around the room, I can see that it's close to quite a few people who are with us tonight, and that is marine protected areas. Now, the presentation is going to be jam packed. So hold on to your seats. I generally try to put far too much in. So I know you sent us that little information thing that said only this many slides and all the rest of it. So I just ignored that. We're going to go for it. And Hopefully by the end, many of your questions about marine protected areas will be answered. But if there's still some questions at the end, I'd be very happy to take them. Presentation today is marine protected areas in South Africa, what, why, where, and a little bit more. And I'm not putting my name at the bottom of this slide because this slide is really done on behalf of everybody who has worked so hard towards marine protected areas in South Africa. So I want to start off by acknowledging them all and saying thank you to all of them for their hard work, their photos, their commitment, and for their passion for our oceans. So let's start off at the very beginning with what are marine protected areas? Now, if we think about the land, South Africa, and you all know this because I've listened to quite a few of your presentations on LCA, South Africa is home to amazing biodiversity. In fact, we're one of the top global biodiversity hotspots. And you are all really familiar with some of the amazing animals that are found in South Africa. The reason for this incredible biodiversity is because we've got a whole range of different terrestrial ecosystems or biomes. We've got deserts and fynbos, we've got grasslands, we've got forests, and each of these different biomes supports a different set of plants and a different set of animals. And to protect this diversity, we have a whole range of different national, provincial, and private reserves. And these are situated around the whole country. And together they protect about 7.8, maybe a little bit more of our terrestrial surface area. So we've got protected areas on the far west coast to protect the risk felt, to protect deserts. We've got protected areas on the east side of the country to protect bush felt and protected areas around the rest of the country so that we cannot just only protect bushveld or only protect deserts or only protect fanbos. We want to protect in these areas a representative range of South Africa's biodiversity. Now, in the ocean, we also have incredible biodiversity, incredible plants and incredible animals. And around our coast, we actually have an amazing number of different ecosystems or marine biomes. And this is from work that Kerry Sink and her team have done. So here you can see around the coast of South Africa, a whole range of different colors. And each of those different colors represents a different marine biome. Now, something that I need to point out to you right now is that little, little arrow that you can see on the top right of your screen. And that says that is our exclusive economic zone. Now, that is the part of South Africa's sea that is actually under our control. So that stretches 200 nautical miles offshore. And this exclusive economic zone is the part of the seabed that South Africa has the responsibility for. So it's part of South Africa. We often don't think about it, but it actually is part of South Africa. We are responsible for its conservation. And that's what Kerry and the other scientists have spent a long time working on is just understanding which are the different ecosystems that we have out there. And you can see it stretches all the way from, if we look now, we've got on the east coast, we've got incredible coral reefs, amazing, amazing cities in the ocean that are based on the tiny little animals called corals. Down in the Southern Cape, we've got a completely different set of ecosystems supporting a different range of animals. Offshore, we've got a whole range of different species and animals, another set of different ecosystems. 
And even things like these sandy bottoms that don't look like they're supporting much, but are incredibly rich and important for fisheries productivity. So just like on land, we've got different ecosystems and we need a range of protected areas to protect them all. In the ocean, we have different ecosystems and we need a range of different protected areas to protect this ocean biodiversity. So very simply, what are marine protected areas? A marine protected area is an area of coastline or ocean that is specially protected for the benefit of people and nature. They're like underwater national parks, safe places for marine creatures and their homes. And we like to talk to them or call them the Serengetis or the, the Kruger National Parks of the ocean. Why do we need MPAs? I think that I've covered the first two points pretty well already. Our marine protected areas are able to protect a wide range of different habitats and species. But more than that, they're able to protect rare and endemic plants and animals. And I'm sure, Mike, you're really happy to see that I've got a coelacanth in this slide presentation. So that is one of the rare and endangered animals that endemic, well, not endemic, but one of the rare animals that occurs up in the Isimangaliso marine protected area. And then also importantly, MPAs help to protect animals in vulnerable life history stages. It could be where animals are spawning, where they're reproducing. If we take, for example, Apanesi Mangaliso, where the turtles are nesting, that's a vulnerable life history stage. And the marine protected area up there protects these turtles when they come up onto their beaches to nest. But it's not just about animals and about biodiversity. MPAs also have economic benefits. They help to promote tourism. They're very important, increasingly important in job creation. And as we see, coastal and marine ecotourism is one of the fastest growing of all the sectors of tourism. We're going to need increased emphasis on MPAs. And obviously, we'll see associated with that increased job creation. They also help to streamline the ocean economy in terms of how do we make decisions about where to do certain developments, where to do um, exploration, etc. So they do help to streamline the ocean economy. And we're really very much a part of the, the government's blue economy drive. MPAs are also important because they support use. They're really vital benchmarks to show us what nature looks like in an untouched state. So for research, MPAs are critical. And they're also important to support culturally important and historically important sites. We have a project running now that's looking at culturally important sites around the coast and how we can encourage the support um, of, of communities for these sites, how we can make people aware of these culturally important sites. And then again, really important for education. MPAs are wonderful outdoor classrooms to take children into. I know that LCA has a strong emphasis on environmental education and environmental education is very close to my heart. In fact, one of the reasons I, I really became a marine biologist is because I wanted to share all the amazing animals that live on the rock pools with other kids and with adults. And that's really what MPAs are able to do. They're supporting through being wonderful outdoor classrooms and recreation. They're an incredible place for us to go to, to just relax and enjoy. So they're important for recreation as well. Now I'm going to get to one of the sets of benefits which talks around fisheries management. So unlike terrestrial protected areas, which you put a fence around. In the ocean, we don't put a fence around a marine protected area. So we gave a whole set of benefits from MPAs that are so important for fisheries. So they're firstly, very importantly, safe spaces for fish to grow and to breed. Now we've been doing research in our marine protected areas around South Africa for several years. And our research has shown that in areas without fishing, the fish are much more abundant. So naturally it makes sense. If you're fishing an area, you're going to have fewer fish, but inside a no-take area in a marine protected area, you're going to have very, very more fish. So fish are more abundant in the no-take zones of marine protected areas than outside. 
So more fish in MPAs mean better fish catches outside. And I'll explain to you how that works just now. Another thing that we see is fish inside the no-take areas of a marine protected area are much bigger than those in the areas where people are allowed to catch them. So we've got more fish in the no-take areas of marine protected areas, and we've got bigger fish in our marine protected areas. And this has been found in multiple marine protected areas. For example, De Hoop, Gokama, Tsitsikama, our oldest MPA, the Amatole, Dwesetwebe, Ponderland, and Isimangalisa. So we have a lot of proof for this. Then we have something that's quite interesting. It's uh, relates to the fact that big, old, fat, fecund female fish are really good to produce lots and lots and lots of eggs. So if we leave females to get bigger and stronger in the marine protected areas, a big female can lay way more eggs than a smaller female. And you can see this work that's been done internationally that shows that a little 40 centimeter female will only produce hmm, 350,000 eggs. If you let that female get up to about 60 centimeters, she can produce about 3 million eggs. And not only can she produce more eggs, but her eggs and her offspring are genetically fitter because she's tough. She survived all sorts of things happening out at sea. So she's got good genes to pass on. So this is called the BOF hypothesis. And what it says is that if we let the female fish get big and strong in the marine protected areas, she will lay away more eggs, her eggs will be bigger with better survival rates, and her offspring will be genetically fitter, which is what we want. And then we have something called spillover. Because we don't have egg, we don't have fences around our marine protected areas, the fish that are in the marine protected area are able to spawn and they have egg and larval dispersal into the areas that are open to fishing. So when Bruce talks about this, he always talks about looking after your money in the bank. So you're looking after the fish in the marine protected area, and then you can fish the interest. So as long as you keep your capital in the bank, you can keep using the interest. But if you take that capital out of the bank, you won't have any interest. So our fish in the marine protected area are like our capital. There are important animals to look after because they will reproduce and then you can fish the interest. So more fish in NPAs mean better fish catches outside. And this research has been proven in also, as we've said, in many of our marine protected areas, we actually have the science to prove this. Another thing that's really important is that fish communities that are protected in no-take areas are more natural with more and bigger predators. So if you think of it, the fish that are caught out are generally the bigger, more aggressive fish. Those are the ones that the fishermen catch first. So you're left with a skewed ecosystem. Your natural balance is disturbed in areas where there is fishing. In areas that there is no fishing, you get a natural ecosystem. So you have some big predators, some of the next size, all the way down to the smallest. So we're able to protect a representative range of the animals that should be on an ecosystem or should be found in that particular ecosystem. So this is another bit of interesting research that's been done in several of our marine protected areas. We're starting to see just how much fishing impacts on the community structure. Moving on to another set of benefits, they should be models of fair and open governance. They're not always, but they should be because MPAs can help to recognize rights and help to share benefits and also reduce conflicts. So an MPA that is properly designed through transparent and inclusive decision-making processes should actually help people and help to ensure that rights are fairly allocated. The next one we're starting to see increasingly now are the benefits of marine protected areas in the face of climate change. 
Our marine protected areas, for example, mangroves or coral reefs are able to protect coastlines and coastal populations from extreme weather events, tsunamis and coastal erosion. And I think that all of us on this call probably know a lot about the impact of climate change that we're starting to see. So MPAs are part of our, our toolkit of helping to mitigate the effects of climate change and reduce the impact on people. So to summarize, the fisheries benefits of marine protected areas first. We've got more fish, they're bigger, they have a higher reproductive capacity, they're more fertile, remember those boff females. They're genetically fitter. The capacity to produce spillover, which is that bit that says if you fish on either side of a marine protected area, you're probably going to catch more fish because of that spillover. They're more natural fish communities, they're more balanced. Research that's happening right now in the Tsitsikama MPA and a couple of others is showing that the fish in MPAs are physiologically fitter. So they're able to be more resilient in the face of climate change, but that's a whole nother talk. The other benefits, just to summarize, climate change resilience, they're living laboratories, a benchmark for research. They're an outdoor classroom. They've got tourism and recreational draw card, which has economic benefits, job creation, which is again important for the economy, spiritual regeneration. These are amazing places just to go to for our spirit, just to keep us, keep us grounded. Conflict resolution, cultural hotspots, and then they're also important in streamlining marine spatial planning. So hopefully by now, at the end of uh, about 20 minutes of me talking, you're convinced that there are lots of benefits to marine protected areas. Now, I started off with showing all of those amazing ecosystems, and I said we needed a range of different e of MPAs to protect a range of different ecosystems and biodiversity. But where are our marine protected areas? Well, before 2019, we had a whopping big 0.4% of the exclusive economic zone around South Africa protected in MPAs. So we weren't doing a very good job of protecting that range of different ecosystems. So how do we choose where to put our marine protected areas? I mean, the coast is big, the ocean is enormous. How do you choose? And here I'd like to give credit to the Isimvelo KZN Wildlife Scientific Services team. And I'm going to pay tribute to a very, very special lady who did a huge amount of work towards our marine spatial planning in, in KZN especially. So yeah, she knows who she is. She's no longer with us. So just a, a very big, a very big tribute to her. Um, she was really involved in this work hugely for many, many years, and she passed away today. So how do we do it? Firstly, we have to map the biodiversity. We have to find out what is out there. And our scientists have done an enormous amount of work. We've got amazing new technology that's enabling us to sample the seabed, to look and see what fish are there, what 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 what's actually out there and we've got the new technology that's enabling us to get deeper out into the ocean and to find out what's there then we need to set conservation targets for the biodiversity features how much what percentage of each of these biodiversity hotspots each of these ecosystems do we want to protect then we need to say what are the threats and the uses of the environment so who's using what where then we need to assess the status of the areas and perform a gap analysis. So where should we really prioritize our protection? Where is it a no-go area to protect? Then we use something that's called MarkSan, which is very complicated software. I've got no idea how it works. Run the conservation plan, and that helps us to identify the priority areas to achieve those targets that we've set. And then ultimately, the next step would be the implementation of the MPAs, which is a huge, huge step. So I'm just going to take an example of the KZN coast of South Africa. So that would be just for an example, our planning domain, the area that we're looking at. The first thing is to look at the habitats. 
what's coastal, what's offshore, where are the estuaries, where are the coral reefs, where are the rocky reefs, where are the canyons? And then each of those could be subdivided further. Then we want to look at the species distribution. Where are the fish? Where are the mammals? Where are the turtles? Where are the invertebrates, et cetera, et cetera? So what is actually living in those different habitats? Then looking at processes. Where are the estuarine processes? Where are the eddies? Where are the areas of upwelling? Um, so what is actually happening out in the ocean? So really the scientists have got a very, very good idea of what's happening in this particular planning domain. The next thing they want to look at is who's using it where. So what are the patterns of use? And this is a picture of that KZN coast down, you can see on the left-hand side would be the coastline. And then the really red areas are the areas where there is lots of human use. So that would be ship trafficking, fishing, et cetera, et cetera. It's pointless saying we're gonna put an MPA right in the middle of one of those hotspots. It's never going to work. So we've got to be able to look at what where people are using the ocean and make sure that we try to, to not influence those areas. You can see the hotspot around Durban, that ribbon development down the south coast, and then some of the fishing grounds. So where did we start with KZN? That was our MPA network right at the beginning, did all of that work, ran the plans, and this is what came up as the critical biodiversity areas that we wanted to protect. So critical biodiversity area one was something that we really, really had to get. And two, please, 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 no matter how the negotiations work with MPAs, these are the ones that we really want to protect. And then optimal would be the biodiversity areas three. So you can see how much work goes in before we even get to the stage that says, these are where we would like the MPAs to happen. So all of that science happens. Then it goes through an incredibly long process of public consultation, talking to people, telling them what we're looking at, talking about why we need them, et cetera. And that process took many, many, many years. And here I need to pay tribute to another whole group of people who really helped to push this through the government process. And it, as I said, it took many years until ultimately on the 1st of August 2019, 20 new marine protected areas were implemented in South Africa. And that took our MPA real estate from 0.4% to 5%. And here there was a big team of people working behind the scenes with government, with oil and gas industry, with the fishing industry, with communities, and they put their heart and soul into this process. And there are very, very few countries in the world who can say they got 20 new marine protected areas at once. And I am so proud of our South African team for their dedication for really pushing to get us to this point. Now, I'm not going to go into this in a whole lot of detail, but what I do want you to know is that our marine protected areas, each one is zoned for different use. So when we say marine protected area, we don't mean nobody can do anything in the marine protected area. In some areas of the marine protected areas, you can fish. In some areas, you can't fish. You can do certain types of fishing in some areas and not in others. So there are fully protected zones where you're not allowed to do anything. And then there are controlled use zones where there are different types of fishing allowed. And we've produced some videos through South African Association for Marine Biological Research. And these videos can explain the zonation of particularly the NPAs that are in KZN. Now, there might be some of you that are going, hmm, is 5% such a big deal? Yes, 5% is a big deal because about 90% of our exclusive economic zone has actually been allocated to oil and gas companies for their exploration. So this 5% that we have is a big deal. It's really, really important. So we've got all the good news about MPAs, but it's important to know that although we've got to 5% and we're working towards 10%, the international target is now 30% of your EEZ should be an MPA. So the bar is high. In South Africa, we do have insufficient funding and capacity for management. We've got amazing managers around the coast who are doing their best, but they need more capacity. They need more funding. We still have poaching in many of our MPAs. 
There is in many areas a lack of community support and conflict. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. A lack of public understanding of what MPAs are. And then threats of mining and oil and gas exploration extraction is very, very real. So the seismic surveys, things that we were talking about in the Transkei Coast a little while ago haven't gone away, and pollution is another problem. So I'm just going to quickly touch on two points. The one is lack of community support and conflict, and then the other one is public understanding, and I'm going to start with the second one first. So we did some research at the aquarium in Durban, and we asked our visitors to name three marine protected areas in South Africa. What we found was that about 80% could not name one marine protected area. Now, the reason we did this research is because at that time, we were really trying to support the team who were wanting to push the new marine protected areas through the government process and get them proclaimed. And we realized that we were telling people about these amazing marine protected areas but 90% of the people or 80% of the people we were talking to did not know what a marine protected area was. They had never heard of a marine protected area. And in fact, if you look back at research on marine protected areas since about 1970, 60, all of the research, a lot of the researchers said, we need to create greater awareness within the public about what a marine protected area is. It's really hard to get people to support something that they've never heard of. And that's why we launched Africa's first Marine Protected Areas Day in 2021. I know that all of you are involved in conservation, so you all know about these special days. Arbor Day, Rhino Day, Oceans Day, Pangolin Day, Turtle Day, Jellyfish Day, Penguin Day. There seems to be a day for everything. But we realized that there actually isn't a day for marine protected areas. So... We decided, as I said in 2021, let's launch the world's first Marine Protected Areas Day. And can anyone guess why we chose the 1st of August? I'm hoping you're all remembering that it was the day that we got our new 20 MPAs proclaimed. So we put together a small team of people. We are still running Marine Protected Areas Day with a small team of people and with absolutely no budget, but we have amazing social media. So you can find information about MPAs and MPA Day on all of our social media side. We've also worked really hard on the mainstream media. I'm very excited that this morning we had our team on Expresso talking about marine protected areas. And this is really powerful because if we want people to protect and to care about the ocean, we've got to start somewhere. And talking about marine protected areas is one weird place to start. Then we've also done lots and lots of activities. We've done webinars, we've done virtual tours where people have the opportunity virtually to actually see scientists, managers, and community members in the MPAs talking about the MPAs. We've got all the marine protected areas on iNaturalist. So any of you who are on iNaturalist, go on there and you could log with the BioBlitz your different animals that you found in marine protected areas. And we've had photo competitions. So lots and lots of hype about marine protected areas, lots of opportunities to engage with people about marine protected areas. Really importantly for us are the on-site activities. This year we had walks along the coast. We have had lots of work with school groups, which is so important. And then obviously aquarium exhibits we've also had. And then if you need to find out more, we've got two websites. The one is marineprotectedareas.org.za. And that in that website, you'll find information about all of our marine protected areas in South Africa. And then our mpaday.org website has got information that's more focused on activities and what's happening for Marine Protected Areas Day. And then we've got some amazing resources that we've put together. Some of the resources are for adults, for example, those fact sheets. We've got maps that people can download all for free from the Sambra website. And we've also got them translated and from English into Isizulu. And then we've got a whole range of kiddies books 
So we've got Cyril the coelacanth, we've got Boozy the butterfly fish, and those have all been translated from English into Isizulu as well. And we've got about six of those. Um, and these are really special resources that any teacher can use to teach about different marine animals. So we've got Cyril the coelacanth, Rupert the red steenbrus, Kemsen the turtle, and they they're really are cute, cute stories. We also have a couple of online resources for adults to use. Um, that little book you can see on the bottom right, you can download and use. This year, we celebrated Marine Protected Areas Day on Tuesday. It was a jam-packed day, and we're proud to say that in Tanzania, they had 70 people, just, uh, just over 70 people, for an online webinar with communities, with their managers, with aquaculture, with a whole group of different people, with tourism, and they were engaging with these people all about marine protected areas. So they had an amazing webinar. Sand Parks in South Africa did a webinar on MPAs. We had a webinar with uh, recreational fishermen. We had just about 100 recreational fishermen join us to look at the pros and cons. Two Oceans Aquarium did an amazing kelp night. We had a walk down the coast. So we really have had many, many more activities than ever before for MPA Day 2023. And we've had engagement across across the world which is it's really exciting if you think that this is a day that was just started in South Africa but not everyone likes MPAs and there are many many communities who do not like marine protected areas because they see them as as grabbing of the ocean they see people feeling like or people having been dispossessed of areas where they would traditionally have fished so yeah, marine protected areas are not the solution to every conservation issue that we're facing. They are one tool in our conservation toolbox. So we need to be able to really engage with communities far more effectively if I want our MPAs to be effective. There are many, many tools around the world available to help managers work with communities and to help managers make sure that marine protected areas work. Because without effective governance, MPAs are simply words on paper. And this is where we really not need to start putting our emphasis. We've got our MPAs, we've got them proclaimed. We need to now make sure that we're working together with communities to make sure that these MPAs actually are effective. They're not what are just called paper parks. So it's becoming increasingly clear that MPAs are effective when they meet multiple goals. They need to meet conservation goals, they need to meet economic goals, and they need to meet social goals. And I know that all of you have been working in conservation, or most of you are working in conservation, and you know that terrestrial protected areas have the same thing. We need to really make sure that our protected areas are able to meet all of those goals, which is a tall order, but I think that it's something that we can do if we are prepared to engage genuinely with people and we are able to put good governance structures in place that take into account the needs of the community as well as the needs of nature. For far too long in conservation, we have spent a huge amount of time studying the prey. And I use this slide very specifically because it was work done by a student um, in Norway and Sayed actually looked at 46,000 odd papers that had been published in the fisheries field. And what he noted was that 43,000 of those papers were about the fish. Only about 3,390 were actually about the fishermen, were about the people who were impacting on those fish. And this was research that was done over about a 26 year period. If we want to manage fisheries, we need to understand people a lot better than we are. If we want to conserve nature, we need to turn around. We need to stop facing the nature that we love. We need to turn around from facing the sea and we need to face people and we need to start engaging, we need to start understanding people far, far better if we want to save these wild places that so many of us care so deeply about. 
So conservation to me is ultimately about people. People are the solution to our conservation problems. And we need to put humans at the center of our discussions. Because caring for nature really means caring for people. And that's why I've been so excited to move my journey from studying fish to studying people, because I think that this is where we're going to find the solutions to many of our challenges. And my last slide is my favorite quote from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And here you can see photos of just a few of those amazing people who have dedicated their lives, in some cases, to our marine environment and to making sure that we protect it, not just for ourselves, but for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Yes, I am sure we're going to have questions. Um, before we head into the questions, we'd just like to, first of all, um, applaud the South African team. And then right in the beginning, you said you're not putting your name on, on the first slide. You wrote the name of the team there who established this expansion of the marine protected areas in South Africa, because it's an enormous achievement. You have to go through a whole lot of education and a whole lot of convincing and lobbying and fighting bureaucracy to establish areas like that. So really congratulations to all of you who worked on that. And we celebrate your work tonight. And then uh, tonight we would also like to thank you for um, just reminding us about this out of sight reserve bank that we have of all these cultural and economical and ecological spiritual resources under the ocean surface. So thank you very much for um, reminding us tonight and also enlightening us on the issues that you face in conserving these resources. We um, thank you. And then the floor is open for, for questions. I see Chris has got his hand up immediately. He beat Marty to it. Uh, Chris, please go ahead. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Judy. No questions asked. Judy, did I hear correctly that when you refer to the special person that you would like to acknowledge, did I hear that you said, I'm a little concerned that I didn't hear right, that you said that she passed or this person passed today? Well, with that said, it's a special day. And I guess also for you as a team, and not an easy day. And thank you. So we honor that person, whoever she is. And I think it makes this talk even more special. So from my side, thank you. And we honor that person with you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Chris. Special thank you to, to Judy also for still committing to the talk on, on this day. Marty, you've got your hand up. Uh, not going to turn on the video because we're in pitch darkness, but uh, thanks very much for the talk. And yeah, especially um, le let's make it count for what that person dedicated. I think it's uh, awesome and amazing. So just a, a, a thought, you know, um, for those people that are not happy about the MPAs and we can understand why, have you got programs where they are turned from fishermen into tourism type um, so that they can actually take advantage because I think um, often the MPAs um, maybe they uh, restrict fishing and that sort of thing but there are other things that benefit from it such as tourism and maybe scuba diving or those sorts of things. Are there almost programs in place? I, I'm talking not from any experience. I, may, I might be not uh, saying the right thing, but um, are there programs to put it in place to actually supplement their income in some way or other so that they can um, join join the um, the movement to, to support um, MPAs? 
I think that that's a, a really good question. And we've recently just worked on three papers. Um, the first one looked at the uh, ecological effectiveness of South African MPAs. The second one looked at the social and the economic effectiveness of our MPAs. And the third one looked at the governance effectiveness of our MPAs. And what came through very clearly with the middle paper is that we need to do a lot more to ensure social and economic effectiveness of MPAs. But having said that, there are many programs around South Africa. Um, I think particularly of some that have been run by Cape Nature down in the Betty's Bay area where they're really working with fishermen to help the fishermen create new opportunities by getting them involved in research. And then around the coast, there are different initiatives similar to that. Some have been happening in the Essimangaliso area. So there are several initiatives around the coast, but we certainly need to upscale up them hugely so that people do start to see the real benefits of marine protected areas. I mean, let's be honest. I don't think um, fishing out at sea is as glamorous as many, many people think. It's a hard, tough, weather beaten difficult life that the guys often don't make ends meet and especially when the fishing stocks are completely depleted they really don't they, they, they can't even get enough fish to to cover their costs so i mean it would be amazing if we could um let them see an economic benefit through what's being done but thanks very much and well done to you guys Thanks, Molly. Um, so I'm going to refer um, Evaristo and Francis and Prof. Bruton. I see your hands are all up, so I'm going to return to you soon. Um, I just want to turn to Lissetti's question in the chat. And Lissetti is chatting, uh, well, um, referring to the issue of open parks versus closed parks and mentioning that fencing of the parks sometimes have a negative effect instead of a positive effect. And that it, actually encourages poaching and whereas it could sometimes be more successful to manage the park as an open park. I hope I'm interpreting it correctly, Lissetti. Um, Judy, would you like to comment on that? Um, well, uh, fencing a marine protected area has, has not been particularly successful except for the little bits on the coast. Um, so I think that we, we, have, we have different problems from the terrestrial environment with that. Uh, managing something as an open park has its benefits, but they need to be, people need to know where the boundaries are. So we need to make sure that people know where the boundaries of a marine protected area is, especially if you're out at sea and fishing out at sea. Obviously on land, it's a little bit easier, but managing a marine protected area without fences is something that most marine protected areas are managed without fences, except for the, the bits that are on the, on the coastline. So I think that we do have different problems to, to terrestrial areas, but it, it's really important for people to know where those boundaries are and, and what they can do and what they can't do. And that's where the zonation of marine protected areas is sometimes difficult to understand. Um, and that's where we need to do a lot more work with people to help them understand what the zonation is, why it's there and, and how, it's, how it's managed. Thanks, Judy. Um, Evaristo, please unmute. Everesta, you're welcome to ask your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Jun, for a good presentation. Even though uh, I have joined late, um, maybe due to the time difference. <laughs> but uh, my question is that apart from um, poisoning and maybe invasive species, what are other common problems that um, marine park are faced from, especially for coral reefs? And, uh, Evaristo, did you say coral reefs? No, I said that apart from uh, poisoning and invasive species, what are other common problems that the marine parks are faced from it? 
Marine, marine protected areas face many, many problems. Um, the first ones really relate to, to governance. So management of marine protected areas is expensive. It's difficult. It requires complicated equipment like boats. It requires skilled people. Sometimes it's dangerous. So managing a marine protected area is difficult. Marine protected areas also require strong community support, which is sometimes difficult. We need to do a lot more work on communicating about marine protected areas. As I've said before, uh, things like pollution, poaching, uh, invasive species are all issues that we face in marine protected areas. So we do have a whole range of issues that the marine protected areas do, do have to overcome. We're, we're looking at things like effective management plans for MPAs. So those are being put in place. So we're starting to take steps in the right direction. But yeah, it, like any form of, of conservation, we face a, set, a similar set of problems to what you probably experience with, with terrestrial conservation. Okay. Uh, thanks for a good explanation. And uh, disease common in uh, marine protected areas or not compared to terrestrial protected areas? So disease is something that we do look at, and that's why understanding the physiology of fish, for example, is really important, making sure that, that the fish that are protected are, are physiologically fitter. So we're starting to understand that. But I'm not aware of a huge amount of disease work around marine protected areas, but there is an increasing amount of work looking at invasive species with marine protected areas. Okay, thanks. Got it. Thank you, Evaristo. Thanks for your questions. Uh, Francis, please go ahead and unmute. Francis, are you there? You're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go for it. Um, how would you create awareness as a student who lives inland without annoying people who don't understand about MPAs? Good question. So firstly, annoy them. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tricky one. No, I think that to, to answer that, it's looking at first step is, is really learning as much as you can about marine protected areas so using the resources that are available contact me if you want more information we've got lots and lots of resources and we've worked really hard to make sure that those resources are accessible to people of all ages so whether you're 10 years old 20 years old or 50 years old or older um, the resources should be accessible to you you should be able to use those resources and then make it fun uh, as, as scientists and as conservationists, we have, for probably most of our careers, told people how terrible things are. We have sold the doom and the gloom. We've spoken about climate change. We've spoken about declining species. We've spoken about the biodiversity loss. We've, we've told people these terrible, terrible things that are happening in the environment. And all that's happening is we're turning people against us. So I was reading a paper a little while ago that said that the people that are now being attracted into the natural sciences are people that are inherently negative, because those are the stories that we've been telling for so many years, which I found really sad. We need to turn that narrative around. So when you're engaging with people about marine protected areas, we're talking about the positives. We're talking about what you can do in MPAs. And I can send you a paper we wrote last year that talks about how to communicate effectively about marine protected areas based on the research that we did at the aquarium in Durban. Um, so we've got a whole series of principles about how to engage with people in a way that is empowering as opposed to being annoying. I hope that helps answer your question, Francis. It does, thank you. And then in response to that, how do you teach people about hippo? Okay, Francis, I think that we need to have a whole session on effective communication about conservation, because I've got another whole presentation that I can do on that, which is based on the work that I did um, when I was studying, which was really looking at how to engage people more effectively about 
communicate well, about conservation and especially about the ocean. So I can give you lots of tips on that, but that's another whole talk on, on conservation psychology and communication. Thank you. Marit, could you please also um, send Francis the links to the um, share screen events on environmental education because you'll find a whole lot of resources there. Um, Mike, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Judy. Uh, you're a great spokesperson for MPAs and marine conservation. I've got a, a simple point to make, but I think it's one worth considering. One of the most important things about getting landlubbers, which includes most people, is that they have never stuck their head under the sea. They've never gone deeper than sort of ankle depth into the ocean realm. And I've found that whoever has bothered to go diving, even if they're not sort of aquatically inclined, their mindset and their attitude changes forever. So I believe in our focus looking inland at people, we need to form partnerships and collaborate with dive clubs. We need to promote recreational diving. We need to do everything we can to get people to share the marine environment with us and, and witness the incredible diversity not only of species, but of ecological relationships and functions that, that are going on there. I mean, on land, for instance, we have GoPros at waterholes in game reserves where people can sit at home and watch what's going on there. Why can't we put GoPros in, in biodiverse areas in, in MPAs, and maybe even in the can canyons that the coelacanths frequent? to give people a taste of what's going on there. But no amount of videos and so on, on on TV can replace the actual experience of going underwater. And I think that should be part of our initiative. I couldn't agree more, Mike. And for people that can't get underwater, I've worked in an aquarium for 30 years where we're able to roll back that blue blanket and reveal to people the life under the ocean because we can't expect people to care for something they've never heard of or something they've never seen. So I fully agree with you. Thanks, Prof. Bruton. Much appreciated. Um, Prof. Liesel van Us, please ask your question. Just waiting for the unmuting to happen. There we go. There it goes. Good evening, all. Judy, thank you for this presentation. And just for the broader um, audience, I am based in the middle of South Africa. Um, if I go to Durban, it's 700 kilometers. If I go to Cape Town, it's more than 1,000 kilometers. I did my PhD actually around the coast of, of South Africa. Judy, I was just wondering, for the sake of the students and the question on, on the fencing, Maybe briefly just give an overview of really what we're talking of if we say a marine protected area, the fact that it stretches from the high watermark, low watermark and into the sea a couple of kilometers and then beyond that, it, uh, the different laws um, kicks in with the maritime laws and stuff like that. And then, Mike, I echo you 100%. Um, if you really want to go forward, we need to put a different emphasis of all of us um, living um, inland. Thank you. Okay, thank you for, for that question. What I was thinking of doing is I'm actually just trying to get onto our website here. And I want to, if I can, try and share my screen. Because what I'm going to do now, let's see if this is going to work. Okay, can you see um, my screen now? Yeah, it's working. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to, this is now on the Sombra, Sombra website, which changed about a, two days ago. And I'm just going to show you, um, oh, well, there we go. That won't help us at all. Page is gone. Uh, can you see this one over here? Well, actually, go, I'll go to this the one in my presentation. There we go. Google Maps, uh. 
Yeah, okay, I'm going to actually go to this one here. So I'll share this one since that one didn't work. Okay, uh, can you see one slide of my presentation? Yeah, we can. Okay, so just to talk to your, your question there, that slide is taken from a screenshot. And what it shows is the coastline of the Alawal Shoal Marine Protected Area. So this is the Alawal Shoal Marine Protected Area. This is the KZN South Coast that stretches down. And then you can see that the marine protected area is not just along the coast. It stretches out into the ocean, into that part of the South African coast that South Africa, the part of South African ocean that South Africa is responsible for, that exclusive economic zone. And you can see the different colors are the different zones. Um, so in each of those different zones, in a restricted zone, there are certain things that you can't do. In a green zone, there are certain things that you can and can't do. And in the orange zone, there are certain things that you can and can't do. So that's why we were asked about a fence. It's impossible to put a fence out into the ocean. So we can't put a fence out into the ocean. We could only have that little bit of a fence there maybe, but then you can't really stop people walking along the beach, maybe there, but also we wouldn't put a fence there. So that is the marine protected area and it's stretching out into the sea. I hope that helped to answer that particular question. Thanks, Judy. Yep. Go for it, John. Uh, maybe no, if I can just ask a question helps. further, I mean, um, maybe not with a fence per se, but I mean, what what about sort of okay. shark nets and other nets and things like that? Could that also... Um, also no, because remember what we're not trying, we don't, we don't want to stop the fish. We're actually wanting to, to protect the fish. So nets and that wouldn't work. What we're wanting to do is to manage human activities in these ocean spaces. And then I have just put in the link, a couple of links to some of the resources that you can find, um, some of those resources that I spoke about for education or for communication. I've just put the links into the into the chat. Thanks, Judy. I don't know, Johan, are you back or not? <laughs> Sorry, it's been a bit of a yo-yo effect with um, Johan in and out. I think his uh, bandwidth has got a problem. Um, so I think the next person, um, there was maybe another question. There's a number of them in the chat. Um, I'm just trying to see which ones have and haven't been answered or asked at this point. Um, if there's anybody who hasn't um, had their question asked, please, if you could maybe just put up your hands and then we can um, you just go to your reaction tools at the bottom on the right and uh, raise your hand and then we can um, allow you to unmute and ask your question. Um, I'm not uh, a bit difficult to, to keep track um, with your hand gone. Uh, Lizzo, let's, let me let you unmute yourself and then ask any questions, hang two seconds. Just trying to, uh, Marit, will you unmute please? Yeah, good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity and amazing presentation on the MPAs of South Africa. I'm, a, I'm one of the young people from the Eastern Cape, like Wild Coast based, but uh, I have an opportunity, I had the opportunity to go and work in one of the best MPAs in, in, in South Africa to hoop multiple areas in the Western Cape. And I've been there for the past three years. I've met amazing people going there, looking at the whales, looking at their shores, and, and, and loving the place and going back, giving feedback. Marine biology is top professors. Like I think I've met also Prof. Uh, Mike Britton. He was there and he gave amazing talk on the whales with the history and how they came about, which is even today, I still go and share with my clients because I'm a top guide on that side. But basically I'm from the wild coast. And in the last, I think the last two years, I found out that in the wild coast, there's a Mpondo, Mpondo land, Maribri area, that side. And me coming from that side, I was so shocked because it was the first time hearing about it. And then I took a journey to go back home and going along the, uh, the Mpondo land wild uh, coastline and just to get from the fishermen, from the people who are harvesting uh, 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 mussels, everything. If do they, do they know that it's under protection? Some of them, yes, they were. 
but they lack understanding of why they are protection because some of them they are scared to fish. Some of them, if you say there's police coming, they drop their masters, they drop their oysters and run. Some even hate themselves. But I asked them, why are you running? Do you understand why it's is protected? They said, no, but uh, nature is going to arrest us. So what I'm saying is that this is a best presentation. Um, what I'd like us to do is the professors, the people with knowledge and stuff, we have all the papers and we're actually living and want to protect these uh, manifest areas, which are very beautiful, which is a very good point for us to enjoy. And then also for the future, we need to go back to these like uh, coastal communities. We need to tell the fishermen that why you must fish a certain type of fish, why you must do certain things, what's the reason? It must be why that we answer. Not just say, and then arrest people, people are running around, they are scared, they don't lack understanding. So with this, I want all of us to go out there and share the experience and share the knowledge. Not only be like I'm a professor, I'm a scientist, I'm, I'm, I'm hiding my thesis. Let's go out there. Because many fishermen are only doing the best for their families. And then also it's just maybe a, a small part of the whole problem. But again, they still lack, lack many like knowledge was to be shared, to be told, not to be educated, to be create awareness, aware of why they are doing, why the same thing there's these laws and stuff. But I'm so happy that I'm part of this MPA today. I got to listen and learn much more to, to everyone involved. Thank you so much. But I want us to go out there and actually practice this without bringing the big cameras and companies. Just go take, take your fish road to Wild Coast, Boston Jones, fish there for today, tomorrow. Leave your fish road, take the people who were there with you yesterday, and then give them new eyes and new things. Let's start from there. Thank you so much for the opportunity once again. I will be following and see how the MPAs are growing and being one of the best with the global ocean. Thank you, Lizo. Um, let's let Judy respond. That's great. Thank you. Lizo, I think that you have, have really hit the nail on the head about what we need to do. And it's, it's work that we've done for many years with communities from Cozy Bay all the way down the Eastern Cape. So we've done a lot of that training, but we are only we haven't even touched the surface. So I fully agree with you. We need a lot more community engagement and it needs to be a two-way. It's not a one-way. It's a two-way communication with communities. So fully agree. Thanks very much. I see Bruce has his hand up. I'm not too sure if we were going to allow him to talk. Maybe he's going to not be so kind as the first time. So should I rather ask you a question from the chat quickly or do you want to risk going with Bruce? <laughs> Go with Bruce. Okay, Bruce, uh, it's your, your turn to, to shine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank, thanks very much. Yeah, I just wanted, I just wanted to also uh, respond to Lisa's um, comments about Ponderland. Um, I have been working there for, sure, the past 20 years, um, and I was um, involved in the original setting up of that, that area. And in terms of the coastline, it's actually a very small area that um, coastal communities are not allowed to harvest um, fish in, or crayfish or mussels or whatever. And it really is in the, the special areas like Waterfall Bluff um, and the Nkambati MPA where there's, there's no harvesting allowed. Um, so there's, there's small areas that are zoned um, for no take within that greater Ponderland MPA for shore, for shore use. But absolutely there's the need for greater communication and greater awareness um, and working with those, those communities to explain to them the, the, the rationale behind the, those no-take areas and how they can benefit from them in the long run. So, yeah, but good question. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure that that's helped to give some clarity. I'm going to just uh, ask one of the questions from... Um, Sandra Hardy, uh, what about intervention in proposed seismic activity? I don't know if, um, I don't think that's allowed in the marine protected areas, if, uh, if I'm understanding things correctly, but uh, Judy, maybe if you've got any other comments um, of, of intervention um, on proposed seismic activity. So obviously that sort of thing would not be allowed in a marine protected area. So from a marine protected area point of view, definitely not. But then remember that that's only 5% of our EEZ. So there is still a huge amount of our exclusive economic zone that uh, seismic survey could happen in. Um, we recently 
well, about a year, two years ago, had a, a quite a big campaign um, about the seismic surveys that was happening off the Transkei coast in the Eastern Cape. Um, but seismic surveys happening around the whole coast uh, a lot. Um, so in marine protected areas, obviously not, but how do you tell the sound? It mustn't travel into the marine protected area. How do you make sure that that's not happening? Uh, there are a lot of questions around seismic surveys. Cool, thanks very much. Um, one of the other comments, I think someone has already res responded to it, and I think it has maybe been covered, but let's let's um, just read it out, and then I think it's worth having a discussion about. Um, from Asima, wouldn't you say that protected areas have caused more harm than good to the biodiversity, as they usually focus on economic more than than biodiversity? Now, I, I, I think that was a, maybe one of the earlier um, comments that were made. But um, let's maybe have a, a bit of a chat. And it says we've lost about more than 60% of our species, if I'm not mistaken. So despite having marine protected areas, and I don't think it's the marine protected areas to blame, but despite having them, there still, still does seem to be a bit of a loss. I don't know if you can maybe talk about that um, side of things. I think perhaps we're getting a little bit confused with terrestrial protected areas and marine protected areas. So I think that there might be a bit of a, a confusion in, in that in the way that question is, is framed. If we look at marine protected areas, um, they are definitely there to protect biodiversity. As I said at the beginning, they're there to protect fisheries. If you have a no-take zone in a marine protected area, you get that spillover effect that I spoke about, which has economic benefits, which has fisheries benefits. So I think that the, the, the focus has to be on making sure that the marine protected areas protect biodiversity, they protect fish, and then the benefits that come from that are the ones that I spoke about earlier. So I think that we just need to make sure we're not we're not confusing terrestrial protected areas and marine protected areas there. So just, I'm not sure if I've really understood the question correctly. Uh, we, we haven't lost 60% of our biodiversity in the ocean, thank goodness. Um, so, or anywhere, I hope. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there might just be a slight misunderstanding from, from that point of view. I'm not sure if I've helped to clarify it. No, no, that's cool. And I think that's why I wanted to ask the question because clearly there is maybe a bit of misunderstanding. And Asima, maybe if you want to, um, raise your hand and then ask your question and we can help to to get clarity on that. Um, uh, has there been a, any sort of percentage loss that you can um, talk about in terms of marine biodiversity or are, are we still kind of doing quite well with with um, with what we with what we've managed to protect with the marine protected areas? Okay, to answer that, I'm actually going to call on Bruce because he was one of the lead authors of our ecological effectiveness of MPA's paper. So, Bruce, do you want to just give us the headlines of that one? Please. Sure, no problem. Um, yeah, the, what we looked at was ecological effectiveness of our MPAs. And I think virtually in every case um, where the research has, has been done and it was thorough, um, it showed that marine protected areas, if they're well enforced, um, and if they are, particularly if they no take, you do have recovery um, and increase in, in abundance and size of animals. So definitely they, they do work, um, and if they manage correctly. Um, in terms of the question about species loss, some of our fishery species have been heavily overfished. So some of our fish stocks, uh, particularly our lionfish, have been fished down to very low levels. Some of them are down below 5% of the historical levels of abundance. Um, but that's largely through, through fishing and through other, other um, habitat degradation, that kind of thing. And it really is... Um, one of the real strong points about MPAs is, is that we can help build back um, those um, stocks that have been really decimated um, in the past. Um, and already we're seeing some very positive results with some of our lionfish species that have been protected in, in MPA. So it's, it really is a win-win story. No, great. And I think those are great answers. And I'm glad it's being recorded because the SEMA appears to have uh, unfortunately dropped out, possibly load shedding or something, but she'll be able to uh, get those answers on the on the recording. So that, that, that's, that's perfect. Thanks very much.
Um, if there's no other hands up, I'm going to just uh, go through some more of the um, the questions that have popped up. Um, just a comment from Andy Klee. I know he uh, normally um, isn't shy to talk. So Andy, I'm not going to give you the the pleasure of, of me reading your question. You're going to have to talk yourself. I'm, I'm not that uh, gracious. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, cheers, Marty. And thanks, Judy, for a, a fantastic um, presentation and a, an amazing amount of work as well that you and the team have done. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm here in the UK. I don't know if I had much of a question. I think it was the engagement with people. We've um, been trying to do the same here in a small way in the UK, using virtual reality headsets to chuck people underwater on our local um, marine area. I know it's not quite the same as getting wet and getting in, but it just makes that sort of experience so much more accessible. Um, and there are opportunities there. I suppose I have got a question that did pop up. Um, climate change and funding and opportunities like that. You know, there's carbon sequester, so, oh, I can't even say it. it's carbon sequestration to be had with, you know, big fish, more carbon, healthy ocean environment, sucks down carbon. I don't know if that's an area you've explored um, to enhance the effectiveness and appeal of MPAs, but there's there's something in there. I, I don't know. I, I think that um, explaining MPAs from a climate change resilience perspective hasn't been that easy on the South African coast. So it's been difficult to find that link, but it's something that we certainly need to explore more. And we are starting to see more and more research. We had a webinar on. Um, Tuesday with recreational fishermen and uh, Professor Warren Potts was talking about the research that he's done where he's found that fish living in marine protected areas are far more resilient. They've got better genes in the face of climate change. So they're fitter, they're genetically fitter. So by protecting those fish, we're actually protecting fish stocks that'll be able to survive climate change much more effectively. Um, so there's that sort of research going on, but it's it's a tricky to, to kind of really explain that easily at this stage but we're getting there we're working on it so it, it is an important point yeah i think the, the other part of that as well is just you know restoring seagrass and mangrove and all the other wonderful ecosystems um mm -hmm. i know it's all linked i mean but mangroves stuck carbon down like nobody's business i don't know what i can't remember the figures off the top of my head same with seagrass mm -hmm. so there's quite yeah, a lot of interest yeah. in the uk so again it's it's another avenue to try and get interest and funding for you but there you go i'll, I'll shut up thanks marty Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for being a, a sport and uh, unmuting us off. <laughs> uh, cool. Cheers. Always good to hear from you. Um, there's, there's a comment here from Mark Addison, um, and uh, I think there's a few typos, but it says, I, I think in 2010, whale and dolphin watching was worth two billion US dollars. Eastern Cape needs this um, enabled to get local communities to benefit. And I think it's sort of linking on what I was asking earlier. Um, to maybe change the focus from um, suffering uh, fishing as opposed to um, being able to take advantage of other other um, things. And I mean, two, two billion US dollars is a, is a massive amount of money. Um, and that's really, a... yep, that's, that's starting to look at the economic benefits. What I've been actually just trying to do is I've been trying to find a website, especially for the students that are, are with us tonight. And the website I'm going to put into the chat now is a website that Kerry Sink and her team put together. And this website reveals all of those new ecosystems. So somebody put in the, um, Prof. Liesl put Rocky Shore, Sandy Beaches, et cetera, part of MPAs. The website I want to put into the chat now talks about all of the other um ecosystems that are out there and i'm just i'm with the, the website's name is mzansi and i'm just trying to find the link but basically what this does is it looks at another sure probably another 15 or 20 different marine ecosystems that we actually don't we haven't really exposed our students to so we do rocky shores sandy beaches kelps corals rocky reefs but there are a whole range of other ecosystems out there that, that we should start teaching our students about so i will find the link and i'll share it with with everybody on, on lca um, to share it further because it, it's so exciting to be able to teach about new ecosystems that very few people know anything about perfect thanks very much judy uh, we'll look for look look for that link. I found the link. I've just put it in there. Awesome. Thanks very much, uh, Judy. Um, don't think I've um, missed many of the or any of the 
the, the comments in the chat. No, but thanks very much, Judy. It's uh, been very interesting. And uh, you know, we can we can feel your passion. And uh, it, it wasn't too many slides. So uh, whoever was telling you you had too many slides, you did really well. And it was uh, captivating and in, in, inspirational. So uh, well done for what you guys have been doing there. And um, yeah, I mean, seemingly from something that was founded in South Africa, the um, the, the world has a lot to learn from us. Thank you so much, Marty. Thank you, everyone, for staying and listening. Lovely to share marine protected areas and ocean conservation with you all, and especially during Marine Protected Areas Week next year. I'm really hoping that on the 1st of August, we're going to see a whole lot more celebrations coming from all of you. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys.